This is our first foray into releasing a podcast, and we're happy you're here with us in our early beta tests. As such, things may be a little rough at first as we iron out audio, video, and studio setup issues. Hang in there while we get our bearings, so we can bring you much higher quality future episodes. Welcome to the Geek Bits Podcast with your hosts, Mike, David, and Craig. Welcome to this new podcast. We actually have not even come up with a name for it yet. Uh, I am David, uh, your host for this particular episode, uh, uh, better known as the 8-Bit Guy on YouTube. I am joined by my brother Mike, who runs the Geek Pub, and we also have a friend of ours that we have known uh, since childhood um, here with us, whose name is Craig Bose. And we're going to be talking in this episode about uh, piracy and uh, both old school piracy and uh, modern piracy and uh, what the uh, ethics and considerations are in that. And uh, yeah, so what do you, <laughs> I'll, I'll end it over. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. Well, welcome to the first podcast, guys. We're all glad you're, uh, you're joining us. And uh, this is all new for us. And so it's a little bit of a experiment and we'll just, uh, we'll figure out where it goes. And hopefully this turns into something big and, and, and we'll just see. So, um, yeah, so today's topic is piracy. And, you know, we all have, you know, as, as we think about our childhood, our, our own different experiences with piracy and um, all the way back to, the, you know, the Commodore days at, at your house. And then uh, uh, also with, uh, you know, modern um, inconveniences with piracy. And so, I mean, I think personally we should, we should start by mentioning the fact that, um, you know, piracy started long before computers. Like there were people, you know, with, with bands and, and, and uh, not what, they, what do you call them? not bands, but um, bootlegs uh, back, you know, a long time ago recording you know just uh, uh, concerts and stuff and that's that kind of where, where it really got its roots but yeah we all really know it as, as computers so um, I mean that you want to kind of reminds me of a, I'm sure you did this but having like a cassette player hooked up to the radio oh like, yeah you know, the, and just recording stuff off the radio and <laughs> and now by you know today's standards that seems so ridiculously <laughs> primitive and well, you know, poor audio quality. The and fascinating everything. thing about that, though, that was never considered illegal. That was actually perfectly That's legal. Right. There was interesting loopholes in the law for anything that was broadcast, uh, both TV, if mm. you want yeah, to record it on I VCR. I forgot about that. Yeah, if you yeah. broadcast and it publicly, then it was not piracy. Yeah, so you could have a huge videotape collection of Star Trek or Doctor Who. We all did, actually. We had, you know, yeah. stuff <laughs> like that and music that we recorded off the radio. And while the fidelity was maybe a little bit lower, we didn't pay anything for that. And uh, in fact, to be honest, the video quality was probably a little bit better than if we'd tried to copy from VHS to VHS from like a, a store bought yeah, tape that's, or yeah, something like true. that. Uh, we did have to have the commercials though, but we could skip them or well, we could stop the recording. Funny yeah. enough, and this is a little tangent, but you actually did a video on the um, I think years ago about was VHS that bad or something, yeah. and, and covered a couple of those those yeah. topics. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, <laughs> moving on to piracy of the computer software. So uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting that we have Craig here because he was probably the very first person that my brother and I copied a video game from. <laughs> Most likely. Uh, we, so what you're yeah. saying is I was like, I led you into yeah, crime, basically. led us into crime. Good. Like, that's, that's a good <laughs> feather in my cap. So. Yeah. So I remember, and I could be wrong, but I remember going to Craig's house when we were like, well, I was probably like seven or eight, and you were three years older than me, of course, and Craig is older than me as well. But, but I remember when we went to his house, he had a Commodore sixty four, we had a Vic twenty, so we were kind of like, ooh, this is the upgrade. Oh thing. yeah, Craig was the cool friend. There's no doubt. Yeah, I mean, yeah. by some <laughs> definition of cool back then, because like geeks yeah. were not in the way they are now. No, yeah, no, yeah, that's, yeah. that yeah. is so true. But I do remember the very first thing I ever saw him playing when I walked into his house. He booted up a video game. That I've actually never played to this to this day, but I remember seeing it. And it stuck in my mind. It was called the Standing Stones. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's I funny you mentioned that. I played through that game recently. Really, <laughs> I did. <laughs> did you know that is that was my first exposure? Like the first video game I had on the Commodore sixty four, and it was my first exposure to role playing games in general. Not even computer role playing games because I hadn't even played Dungeons and Dragons or anything. We could do. Easily, I could do a whole podcast on role-playing games and stuff like that and that whole history. But there's that tie between those, and that was the first, you know, exposure I had to any of that. And then later, 
we had a pirated copy of uh, Ultima 3. Oh, yeah. Thanks to uh, <laughs> our friend Roy. Sorry, Richard. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... So, yeah, one of the ethical concerns that I wanted to bring up and and have a discussion about is, as kids, we did not have the money to buy these games uh, from the store because they were like $40, $50. Yeah, how how old were we when when this stuff all... I was like seven or eight when when we were starting that. And so the question is, ethically speaking, did we cause any financial harm, uh, as in lack of sales, to the publishing companies of those games by not buying them instead of, uh, you know, copying them. And the argument here, at least one side of the argument, is we wouldn't, if, if because we didn't have any money, we would just simply not have bought them. We would simply have not have had the games, we would not have experienced them, and we would, they would have still not gotten any money from us because we were kids. <laughs> So did we actually hurt them? I think for the most part, the answer is no, but I, I want to hear uh, what, what you guys think on that. I mean, you, you mentioned this earlier uh, before the podcast. Like, you could make the argument that to a very small degree, we might have saved our pennies and bought a copy of a game. In fact, you, me, and Roy did that with Ultima 4, yep. and we just split it three ways. So they did get some money. <laughs> From us, I but that was the only way. About that. I still have your original discs, by the way. If you want those, oh back. my gosh, so, wow! It has your old address on it. But so there might be like a tiny bit of financial harm. Um, I can't imagine me ever having the money to afford the the software library that I had. Not with just games, but things. Well, yeah, like I mean, Merlin I, I know and Dissector. Hundreds of games. Like yeah. I had, like I would go to the. It seemed like anyway. I would go to the Walmart. I think it was. You know, every week and buy a box of discs because I had more games I was downloading from bulletin board systems. But the truth of the matter is, most of those games I played one time, I hated them and I never played them again. You know? <laughs> well, there was notoriously bad games for eight yeah, bit yeah. computers. Like, but, yeah. So that was actually one of the t- talking points that that I, I wanted to bring up is is back then um, the game companies kind of you know well not all of them but a lot of them kind of screwed you over because they would literally just like pump out a bunch of crappy games that they could pump out real fast um, and then throw some marketing behind it. Yeah, and know. we didn't have any way to try those games out before we bought them unless unless one of our friends happened to have the game or you know if it was like a Nintendo game or even Atari game at the time they used to have consoles set up sometimes in a, in like Target and Walmart and, and Kmart and places like that where you might see one game like you could go out and play one game there's usually a line of people waiting to play it. But you you know all the other games on the shelf you had no idea whether they're really any good or not. In fact, that's what caused the video game crash of, of 1983 yeah. was because there was so much crappy games being put out. Um, and, you know, parents would go in and they're like, oh, I'm going to buy my kid a game. Well, gee, there's these ones here for $40 that are, you know, well-known games like Donkey Kong or whatever. But then there's this weird clone game here for 10 bucks. Uh, I'll buy that. And, of course, the game was horrible, yeah. so the kid doesn't yeah. want to play Puppy it. Puppy Kong or something. Yeah. <laughs> Was terrible. Right, yeah, and yeah. you know, and the kid doesn't want to play it, so then they lose interest in video games. Uh, you know, I didn't and realize that. So, like, um, <laughs> bad video games contribute. I mean, that's kind of like the uh, the ET game, right? The notorious yeah. like yeah. landfills of the ET cartridges mm-hmm. was, which actually I don't think it's actually that bad. But that of a was game. a big budget game, though. That 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 was not. Yeah, but even it, though it wasn't any good, a lot of people hated it. <laughs> even but. though it wasn't any good, that was still a big budget game. It was it was all the little. Uh, no name games and stuff for like the Atari that that yeah uh, that were you know cheap. there was a game I got for Christmas from a family member I'll not say their names because <laughs> I don't want to offend them but um, it was uh, I w- had asked for a game and I don't remember what it was like it was like Wing Commander or something that I asked for and um, I got, the game I got was it was some kind of flight simulator game but it was all like just like triangles and stuff mm-hmm. like it was like very 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 basic it was like low 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 fidelity and um but they bought it and they told me they bought it because they couldn't find the game that i wanted but the the picture on the box was really cool and and we all know that that's not what the game right (laughs) really like at least back then you know that's not what games really look like when you turn the box on the back side it's a completely different uh, experience it's a bunch of pixels yeah yeah yeah. Echelon. That was the name of the game that I got. I, I got the feel game. I like that one. Was, and yeah. it was bad? Oh, it was terrible. Absolutely terrible. I feel terrible. like I played that at some point. Yeah. I just can't remember. So um, to kind of circle back around where we were with that. So, yeah, the game companies didn't give us any way to try out a game. Right. There was um, no shareware even back right, then. Right. But, you know, we could download it from a BBS and... <laughs> 
and try it out and decide whether we liked it or not. But ultimately, we probably still wouldn't buy it in most cases. Although Mike has told me about a couple where he did go buy it. I want you. Yeah, something. yeah, no. I mean, I think that's a that's a really good point. Uh, there were a few games that I actually did go buy, like after the fact, and and Ultima was one of them. You, you, you right. mentioned Ultima three earlier. We, we went into and have these, but all of the Ultimas after that, I bought. Um, I, now look, I pirated them first, and at, at least most of them. <laughs> and then if but, you liked them, you. But yeah, I like, but because I, I wanted the the map, I wanted the coin, I wanted all the little trinkets that came with it. Um, that that all my friends had, and, and the only way I was going to get that, I wasn't going to get that by downloading it's, up a, a it's BBS. It's so <laughs> funny you mention that because like thirty something years later, I started collecting old video games and stuff. And what I want are the boxes and the maps, and even newer games th- that are re- built in the old style. For like, I've got a game uh, just recently for the 2GS, which I haven't played, but it has a, a cloth map and a trinket and all that stuff that I enjoyed as a kid. And so that was a real. I don't know, um, hook into yeah. getting you to buy the game was yeah. all those, you know, the big box experience yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So um, I think we can safely say that if we hadn't had piracy available to us for whatever reason, te- whether it be a technological or some other kind of reason where we were simply not able to pirate games, the game companies might have made just a hair more money from us, right. but not a significant amount. We may have pestered uh, our parents a little bit more. Yeah, a yeah. Bit more. Spending yeah. money. For Christmas, I might have really begged for games more or something like yeah. that kind of, kind of stuff. But, yeah, so ultimately they might have made a few extra sales, but, I mean, considering the library, we all had hundreds of games. Uh, we, we would have had a library of, like, ten games instead of instead of hundreds yeah. <laughs> is, is what we would have had. And, uh, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so there's there's two two sides to that to that argument, I suppose. Um, is there anything else anybody want to say about piracy in the? Uh, oh, yeah, actually, there there is there is one more thing I wanted to mention. Uh, so, <laughs> um, there are actually certain ways uh, that uh, the box games were better because sometimes, like Mike said, they come with uh, the, the trinkets and maps and stuff like that and manuals. Because there were actually several games I downloaded from BBSs and never figured out how to play. Uh, because I didn't have the manual. Um, <laughs> and then, um, but there were also some ways that the cracked games were better. Like, because most of the ones that we downloaded from BBSs or copied amongst ourselves were cracked. So that means somebody had gone in and removed the copy protection, which meant the game usually loaded a lot faster. I remember some of those electronic arts games, for oh, example, yeah. would take like yeah. 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, it was brutal. And it had the little EOA uh, logo, like flashing colors on the screen for like 10 freaking minutes, it seemed like, uh, from a di- from a, from a disk drive. And, uh, and it would and just be sitting there, and you could hear your drive like seeking and seeking, and sometimes yeah. it would headbang, right. and all these other other things. It's like, what is it doing? Well, I, it, was, it was going through the copy I think I should yeah. be able to sue a EA now for like 100 IQ points drop for watching that loading screen. Like I watched that for so many hours where I could have been studying or yeah. meditating or doing something. You know, useful. some of the some of the younger kids that might be listening to this who who are playing modern, because, you know, everybody hates EA right now. Yeah. You know? They, <laughs> they, they hated, don't know that we hated them back then. Yeah, too. we hated it before it was cool. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so the the cracked games got rid of that, and so the games actually loaded faster, and they didn't bang the head on your disk drive because all that copy protection now, did stuff. Did they was have removed. cheats back then? Because a lot of the copies of yeah. Commodore games that I get now from way back then yeah. had trainers and yeah. cheats. Yeah, okay. yeah, that was one of the things. Not all of them, but because I don't remember did. having any of those as a kid. Like, <laughs> I'd have cracked games, but they didn't have. Maybe Spelunker was the only one that had. Yeah, I definitely remember uh, cheats in Spelunker because let me tell you, I had to use those all the time because that game was so freaking hard. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, incredibly difficult. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, okay, well, um, I guess now we're gonna jump forward a little bit um, to uh, modern times, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, first the music industry. Now we can go to the '90s. Uh, and, and what we got, we got Napster, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people today won't even remember Napster. Or the younger people have never even heard of it, although there's a Futurama episode about Napster. Uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, now I would say Napster probably did cause a significant loss in revenue um, from uh, music studios uh, at, at its peak because there were millions and millions of people who were downloading uh, music from Napster rather than going to the store and buying a CD. 
But there's a lot of interesting things to be learned from that, I think, uh, looking back at it historically. Uh, first of all, the music companies were very slow to adapt to the change of the Internet. They didn't like streaming. Definitely. Yeah, they didn't like the idea of people, people being able to buy or stream uh, their music. And so that was, you know, kind of one of the results of it was that people would just, just well, share the, it. The irony there is now they all do it. Like, that yeah. is the way yeah. you get your yeah. music right. It's now. like completely flipped upside down. Right. Yeah. So it's it's Apple Music, it's Spotify, um, it's, you know, to a lesser extent, Pandora, you know. And so, like, who buys anything on a physical who even buys the music really like chances no. are you don't even have a copy of the music it's it's weird because i i was going through an old hard drive that has tons of stuff that um a close family member pirated for me and it's like hundreds of songs and they're all from the early 2000s because <laughs> that was the last time we pirated right yeah. like yeah that's when it was big you know that is that is sort of funny like i have a bunch of albums that i really like like i've got def leppard and some of those right. types of things that that i'm really you know fond from my childhood but it's true i don't like any modern stuff i don't care i'll just you know say you know alexa play the song or whatever and and i don't that's now, not, i don't own the song now yeah. the weird thing is in our household we've gotten into vinyl and actual records oh. and i know that's very it's that's very common right now and everything probably not a surprise to anybody <laughs> but we we're actually buying physical media again. Media wow. again, yeah. Because we just like records. I like the experience. I'll you know give a shout out to Docs Records, and if they don't give us some money for this as a commercial, <laughs> we can edit that out later. But um, we just went there the other day, and it was just like great having that experience of like going through. And then of course we're like, is this album any good? Well, let me get my phone and and listen to it on my phone and see if it's good. But we like the. The audio quality yeah. and yeah, you know, I have that some experience. vinyl as well, and uh, yeah, I think I think part of the resurgence of vinyl is because we've completely lost all physical media. Otherwise, so people are like, okay, well, if you're going to collect a media just for the purpose of having media, which one are you going to want? Vinyl makes the most sense, right? Because you know, it's, it's cassettes it's, suck. I mean, yeah, it, like, it does. It does. You know, it's kind of funny too because I remember like vividly when I was probably. I mean, I, I think you probably spent some of the time with me too but i know i would always go with some of our other friends slater and, and some of those guys and we would go to blockbuster music and we would sit in the little booths and listen to music mm -hmm. before we buy an album and there was all of this like experience around buying music and all that's gone like it's all gone right. and i guess vinyl kind of has a way of bringing some of that back yeah i mean i really just look forward to the time when the ai mm -hmm. can not only figure out what music i want to have but buy it for me it'll just go and deduct it from my account you know it won't even have to show me an ad for it it'll just be like okay this is yours and it's like good job ai thank you yeah so um moving a little bit forward the music industry obviously did finally you know wrap Catch their head up. around the, the idea that hey you know what physical media is dying let's move to a new paradigm of selling music and and revenue sources and and they managed to pull that off and the interesting thing is they even eventually got rid of the DRM. So if I wanted to go buy like uh, Taylor Swift's latest song today, for example, I could jump on any number of websites, buy that song, have it delivered to me in a DRM-free manner that I can place on a USB stick or whatever and stick in my car, play it whenever I want, play it on my phone, uh, play it on my computer. Oh, wait. And I'm not really limited by... Uh, by a specific device or a specific ecosystem, right. like you know, like Apple or something like that. Did, did you guys ever run into the issue like you you legitimately bought a song, and I think it was through that whatever the Apple Store, the iTunes Store mm -hmm. was back then. But then you moved to another computer, or you you had to deauthorize on yeah, one yeah, computer. Yeah, yeah, you could only have like three. I think it was like three copies of it or something, and then you yeah. had to deauthorize or three three devices. I think right. it was. And then you had to deauthorize one to play And it, it never worked. Like, you had to have that old device around to deauth it or something. And it just was yeah. a constant hassle yeah. to, like, use the thing that you bought. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was exactly what I'm talking about. That was the digital rights management or DRM. Yeah. And they've fortunately moved, for the most part, away from that. Um, or at least there are definitely options where you can buy music without, you know, the strings attached, so to speak. Uh, the mu uh, movie industry, on the other hand, has not caught up with that concept. No, as a matter of fact, I feel like not only have they not caught up, they are still like actively mm -hmm. like terrorist like level fighting it, and it's and it's it's actually somewhat mind blowing to me. I I don't really understand like. You know, like, it's one thing they can't learn from the sins of their past, but they can't even learn from the sins of others. Right. <laughs> you know, so they've you, watched what happened. You're, you're <laughs> saying, you know, they don't 
they don't want to sell you a copy of the movie without the DRM right. kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like, uh, so, like, if you buy a movie today, it's it's got all of those same things you were just talking about with, you know, authoring your devices and stuff like that. Like, if I buy a movie, and I know there's today, they've got a couple of little tricks around this with, uh, there's, like, a movie play thing you can register your purchases on. But it's all crap, right? It's all crap. Like, if I buy a movie and I want to put it on Plex, my own server, right. but if I want to put it on a USB stick and play it in my car, I don't have that option unless I pirate it or use some kind of tool to remove the DRM from it. And that's BS. I mean, mm-hmm. it really is BS. I guess, like, with our house, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier with renting everything, like, we stream so many of our movies. We don't have cable. Yeah. Like, we stream everything, so we own very little. We have a small Plex collection, again, from years ago. But I guess I didn't realize that it was still in that bad shape. Like, I remember buying the first Thor movie on Blu-ray, and it had a digital copy that was DRM-free. So have they just completely done away with that? Like, I've, never, oh, seen that I've never seen that before. Yeah, that's all news to me. Yeah, and this was years ago. Like, I was like, cool, the industry is leaning in the right direction. I mean, I bought a physical I don't think copy. those were – you're talking about, like, the iTunes digital copy? Um, like there was a long, there was a while there, and I don't know if they're still doing it or not. But but like four or five years ago, like if you bought a Blu-ray, it would say plus iTunes Digital at the top. Um, but that's not DRM free. All it all it basically was was at the end of the day, it was a code to get the movie for free off. Of no, iTunes. this was literally a file on the disc. So you had the disc with the Blu-ray and the disc with the digital copy. Now I don't think the digital copy was as good quality. Like it wasn't Blu-ray quality. Yeah. I, it should bring the, that Thor movie up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> take yeah, a look at it. Yeah, yeah, that would be really interesting uh, to, to uh, rabbit hole to go down for sure. Um, but yeah, so surely the, if you buy it from Amazon, you're not getting anything that you can keep but without yeah, Amazon yeah. letting you. Yeah, so and when you're, when you're locked into that ecosystem, I can't uh, play the movie anywhere I want. I have to play it on a specific app. Often that means I have to have an, an active internet connection. Right. Um, I'm, you know, having to, you know, use my bandwidth. Uh, to play it where if I had the movie on my own home server, I can play it on, you know, any of my TVs in the house. I can play it on any of my computers. I can play it on my iPhone, whatever. It's available to me anywhere, however I want. I can download it to my iPhone, uh, take it with me, like watch it on a plane. Uh, I was just know, thinking that. Like that's, that. The, that's the one place where it's like I want to watch movies and it's it would help to have a local copy. It's on yeah. the plane. And uh, the, the movie companies just are not making that uh, uh, possible without a lot of headache. So there's a few ways. Obviously, you can do it legally. Uh, one way is to go buy a Blu-ray or DVD or something like that and then rip it, which they're making that more and more difficult as time goes by. And the, it's also getting harder to find the physical media because hardly anybody uses it anymore. Right. Um, and so ripping it, of course, is a pain in the butt. And, uh, you know, there's been several movies that, that are actually really hard to rip because they, they do all kinds of crazy stuff in there. Like they'll they'll put uh, like 100 different chapters and, and, and in a weird order. So if you, your regular ripping program doesn't understand how to construct it in the right way. so <laughs> it, <laughs> Okay, <you know. laughs> so, so funny story. I mean, and this is real life stuff. I recently bought the Tom Baker Blu-rays. That, so Doctor Who, Tom Baker is the fourth Doctor. Uh, the, they remastered a lot of those episodes, and they're on Blu-ray now because they had film. And I know it's kind of nice. funny too, but if you watch them, they're like you can tell what scenes were film and what which ones were done on tape because the quality is like really awesome and then really bad, you know, from scene to scene. But but I bought those, and then um, I'm like, man, I really want to put these on my Plex library because I don't want to have to. And I don't even have a freaking DVD player or Blu-ray player, um, you know, on my entertainment center. So how am I going to play this? And so. What I did um, is the first thing I did was went to the Pirate Bay to see if somebody had uploaded it, and they hadn't. <laughs> right. right. Um, so then I'm like, okay, fine, I'll have to rip it myself. And so I got out the ripping tools, and I ripped it, and, this, and that's exactly what happened. I opened it, opened it up, and there's like 200 files on the disks, and they're all the same size, and they got all the same descriptions and stuff. I was like, well, which one is it? And so, sure enough, you know, I try to rip one, and it's like, nope, that's not it. That's some, like, it's just, like, a blank screen. And mm. and so, eventually, I just Googled, and somebody said, oh, yeah, it's, like, file 35. <laughs> yeah. Rip that one, right? But, yeah, they're making it ridiculously hard for no reason whatsoever because I actually bought that media right. and wanted yeah. to use it. But it's the fear of, <laughs> of copying it, yeah. Yeah, distributing yeah. It. so... You know, my thing is for 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 some period of time, probably in the early two thousands, I would go buy uh, a DVD movie uh, and then take it home and rip it. And then it got to where after a few years, it was getting harder and harder to rip them. So I'd be like, okay, I'll buy the movie, and then I'll just go download it off the Pirate Bay for my digital copy. Uh, and then 
you know, at some point or another, it kind of clicked to me. It's like, well, you know, I'm not even using, like, I'm buying these DVDs. I'm not even taking them out of the shrink wrap because I don't want to put them in the player. I want to play them on my right. equipment. And so at some point or another, I'm just like, screw it. I'm not buying the, the, the DVDs anymore. I'm, I, you know, I'm just going to download them from the Pirate Bay and be done with it. And, and I always thought to myself, it's like, well, if they would give me some means, an, an actual mechanism to buy, you know, pay for the movie online. I mean, because what do you pay for a movie these days? Like five bucks or, or something like that on, it, it online? De- it depends on what you're buying. But uh, like in a blockbuster release would probably be like 20 20 Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the last few that I had looked at, uh, I don't remember where it was. It was like five or six bucks or whatever. And I'm like, well, that that's... You know, that's like the cost of buying a hamburger these days. <laughs> where you go. So, I mean, I'm like, there's no reason not to pay it. It's an inconsequential amount of money to me. I'd be happy to pay it. Well, especially the other the- part, I don't know if this is the case with you. I mean, I know you probably have a busy schedule. But as a kid or young adult, I had time but not money. Yeah, and now right. as an adult, it switches. It's like, <laughs> I don't oh, have any time. I gotta get my the money time now, <laughs> means so much more. It's like, here, let me give you, let me shove money in your hand so I don't have to jack so, around so with this copy you, protection. Craig, you actually nailed it right there because it, it, for me, if I had the option of, let's say that it was a $5 movie, right? Mm-hmm. If I had the option to pay $10 for that movie and get it DRM free, I would. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it would yeah. save me the trouble of having yeah. to go find it on, uh, you know, a, a pirate website, which lets face it, some of those are, are really irritating to deal with because you get blasted with all kinds of stupid ads and scams and, and, and attempted and, malware uh, installations. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. and, then, and then like half the time the movie you download is fake because it, it's just like one big... Wait, you're, you're you know, telling me the copy of Max Sweeper that I installed for <laughs> Pirate Bay is not <laughs> <That's> legit? Awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mac uh, Keeper, whatever that god-awful thing. Yeah. I've actually downloaded entire movies before that was like seven or 800 megabytes and then the whole movie is nothing but but a picture of uh, you need to install such and such codec to play this. Yeah, that's the actual movie content. It's not like yeah. a, it, they make it. They make the person think that it's the actual like the the player is complaining it needs a codec, but it's not. It's just, yeah. that's literally the movie. And of course, you go download the codec. It's malware. Yeah. And, uh, oh you man. Know, so that's kind of genius. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you know, sometimes I think if those scammers would just spend a little bit of time, you know, like actually doing productive things, they'd probably be far better off and richer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I don't want to have to deal with all that. If I could go to, uh, you know, uh, uh, CBS or something and, and pay, uh, you know, five bucks, download the, the latest Star Trek Discovery episode and have it DRM free, that would actually be my preference. It would save me time. I'd get a legitimate, probably a better quality copy, and I could throw it right on my uh, on my server, and and then and then um, and then, then it would be mine. I would I'd be able to keep it. But they they don't they simply don't offer a mechanism for it. So. Well, we are, we are yeah. probably not their target market because the three of us are really computer savvy and we have this long history with technology. Uh-huh. And most people, and really maybe I'm not either, like I like having owned movies on Plex and that mm-hmm. stuff. But like I said, we have, just for convenience, we have Disney+, Plus, we have um, the HBO thing, we have Netflix, of course. And we just pay for that stuff like i wish we you know have what my problem is with that though we have turned now for, i mean like like we all asked for like hey movie companies don't make me buy or not movie companies but cable companies don't make me buy a package with 250 channels that i don't want and, right. and the reason that they did that wasn't by the way because they wanted you to have all those channels it was because that's the only way they could get the price up high enough to make your monthly revenue that for the for the cable right. company to be worth it, right? For their business, for their business model. So then now we got this whole, hey, let's let's have these streaming services and Netflix kicked that off. But now I don't need twenty streaming services at twenty dollars a month. And you're paying yeah. the same as you would for cable. Or more. Right. <laughs> and, and they don't even have to provide a cable box or any of the other stuff. So it's actually a better deal for them. <laughs> well not only that, like um, you know, Netflix pulls movies all the time, so you don't ever really own anything oh, yeah. that yeah. way. A movie I could watch yesterday, I can't watch today. Yeah, I had exactly. even heard of, I don't know if this is still the case, I, I could be totally wrong about this, but I had heard people buying books on Amazon or a movie on Amazon, they had bought it to own, and then Amazon's like, oh, we lost our deal with that company. That's exactly right. We're removing your, yeah. your digital file off of your device. Well, that's and not bullshit. giving you your money back. And not giving you your money back, yeah. yeah. Which so that's, that's actually a leads into one of the other points I was going to make. I have a lot of stuff that I have downloaded over the years from, you know, BitTorrent websites and stuff like that 
that is simply not available and never has been available. Uh, for example, I, you know, I have old like Star Trek specials and old Doctor Who, like uh, you know. Uh, th- Unusual things. You're not going to find like a, a DVD or a Blu-ray of this. It was never made. It was aired like one time. Yeah. Like, and then that yeah. was. That so was I it. have I have a great example of that because it's one that I really, 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 um, like like went down a rabbit hole for because I really wanted it and it was the Whiz Kids, and so that was a little uh, TV show that came out in the 80s and it had it was like like these kids that worked on computers and they helped the police right. And I watched that. Which like, is what we were doing with computers. Absolutely. Yeah, we were absolutely. like helping the helping When the we police. weren't pirating software. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right. So, but yeah, I wanted that series. And you can't find it. Like, they don't sell it on, they don't sell it on video cassette. They don't sell it on right. anything. I actually found a copy of it on eBay one time. It was on a DVD. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy that. So I bought it. I paid money for the WizKids. Got it. Only for it to be a, uh, it was completely bogus. Like, it had like two episodes uh-huh. on there. And it was like so- something that somebody like, put on the DVD from a, uh, like, they recorded it when they were a kid on VHS or something, right? And so, like, I actually paid scammers because the actual media company won't make, right. it, make it available yeah. to me. But, so, but I did finally find it on Pirate Bay, like, yeah. a, a few years ago and, and downloaded it and all I that. I would imagine them. in the case of a lot of those kind of things, it's simply there, there's not enough, like, back when we were talking about physical media, there's just some, simply not enough volume sales for them to invest yeah. the, the time in it. But when it comes to a digital release, there's often, I don't think there's much of any excuse uh, not to you know release that that kind of thing. Um, well, I, c- I could see them wanting to like I don't know. It's probably on some old film or something like that. Yeah. So they'd have to digitize that. They'd mm-hmm. probably need to clean up the the audio video quality and stuff yeah. like that. So there would be a financial investment for well I, for Mike and the eight other people that want to right. download WizKids. You're right. But I could make the argument though that says if the movie companies don't want to invest in it, then they should also not. Like, like, what is their incentive to sue me if they don't want to? Yeah. If they don't want to provide it, make it public domain. Yeah, make it public say, domain. here's the quality we've got. We don't want to mess with it. Take it. Do yeah, whatever. take it. And do whatever you want. With and uh, yeah. you know, I give you some other examples of how media companies have done things that I think also uh, incentivize pirating. Uh, region locks, for example. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know. Oh, gee, I can. You know, I live in the United States. There's like some British stuff I was never able to legally get and play over here without buying some kind of like. You know, importing a copy, which is going to cost me like so, twice the price, and so buying a special player. This that's, just you know. happened to me recently with Downton Abbey. So Downton Abbey, their their final hmm. season, it came out in the UK um, like three or four months before they released it in the US. But they it was region locked, and you couldn't watch it. Like if you went to the BBC website to watch it, it would say, "Oh, you can't watch that because you're not in the UK. Your IP address." I guess you get a VPN or something, you could have watched yeah. it. But again, that's still cheating their system, right? Yeah. But if you aren't going to make it available to me. Then I say F you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and of course, back in the, they also had, you know, the Powell versus NTSC standards. And what's funny is we we think about those standards as a you know, just a technological difference. But the movie companies actually loved the fact that Europe and North America had different video standards because that meant that it was much more difficult to, yeah. to import uh, movies. They didn't want, you know, they literally didn't want me to watch uh, movies <laughs> from Europe, you know, uh, for whatever reason. Um, you know, I think... I live, Right along those same lines, too, I think another thing that they did that, like, really encouraged piracy, from at least from my perspective, was when they started taking Blu-rays. It really started with Blu-rays, and it was they started making certain things either unskippable or, like, yes, yes right? Like, Actually, it started with DVDs. Uh, of course, it's, it, originally it started with, like, the FBI ad, and they're like, oh, okay, not ad, but warning. Yeah, right. You know? And I'm like, oh, okay, I can sort of see why they but want But then it was, like, commercials for other movies yes. and junk like then that. And it's like, you're going to force is... me to watch it. I can't skip it. I can't do anything. This is my it. hardware in my home for a thing that I paid for, and you're saying I have to watch an ad every freaking time. That is ridiculous. Yeah. It's and it's the same thing. They're like, literally like, Hitler. I let's got, just, I, let's yeah, just call they it. Are. They are literally the I worst have to people. Watch the same movie trailer. Like if like if you pull that Blu-ray out and that Blu-ray player or not Blu-ray or a DVD, you said right? Yeah. Pull that DVD player out and that DVD today. I still have to watch a trailer for a movie that's 20 years old to watch that movie because yeah. it's yeah. unskippable. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's, they are. They're Hitler. Yeah. It's evil. And, <laughs> and and some of the menus on the DVD, I don't know about the Blu-rays, but some of the DVD menus I had were so ridiculous. Like, how do you find a specific scene? Like, because whoever designed the menu system was brain dead or something like that. And it could take 20 minutes to work through a menu system to take you to a, a particular place where you left off. Because that's something you had to do back then. I mean, with a VHS tape, you just hit stop, you come back to it. When you're ready, you hit play. It's in the right place. But with DVDs, if you stop it, come back and watch the movie later, you got to go... 
uh, well, especially if you, depending on the player, but especially if you ejected it or whatever, you got to go through the, some convoluted menu, and they just did not make it easy yeah. to find your spot after you've watched the you know twenty minutes of forced trailers and everything again, uh, you know and, <laughs> again and whatever else. So I'm curious, like you know, we've bitched p- pretty heavily about like all this you know craziness within DRM and stuff like that. But is there is there a business model where you could own this stuff and not stream it from Disney Plus or whatever. Is there a valid business model for that, you know, to populate your Plex? Or are we just the weirdos in the world that are... We, we you know, that that's a really, really good question, Craig. Because, you know, if you ask probably my kids, mm-hmm. you know, hey, you know... Your kids who pay for nothing, probably. Well, <laughs> yeah, but you know what? No, they they, they, um, they, they have Disney Plus, they have Netflix, mm-hmm. they have all these, these streaming services, right? Um, and then, um, but if you but if you ask them, you know what their concern is? I'll tell you because we just had this conversation with them recently. It is we keep going over on our internet connection because we have a 300 megabit or 300 megabyte data cap, huh. and so like I can't watch all the movies that I want for 14 dollars a month because if I do, then I'm going to have to pay another 20 bucks to AT and T for going over my data cap. That's interesting. <laughs> I haven't had a data cap in a lot of years. I'm yeah, like, well, I don't either because I pay for the the again. It's the, back to the money versus time thing, right? Yeah. But I have enough money to pay for an internet connection that doesn't have a data cap. Right. They don't, and so yeah. That's it. So they're paying for these movie services um, and their internet service, but they can't actually use the, the movie services that they want to because because of the the data cap. Yeah. You know. So I want to throw an idea out there and see what you guys think of it. This would be a potential solution for um, media companies to, to make movies available. Uh, and I don't know if this has ever been thrown around before. It's just something I've thought of. Well, I know, I know they've done similar things with other types of media, but <clears throat> since uh, we, there's a lot of computing power out there now, I mean, you could, you, you know, uh, YouTube, for example, renders one of my videos in like a matter of minutes, right? So when I, when I upload a huge, like, <laughs> gargantuan file up to YouTube, uh, so imagine for a moment that, that I say, okay, uh, you know, I want to go download the latest Avengers movie or something like that. So I say, hey, I want a DRM free version. I'm going to pay, you know, whatever it is, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever it is. And then it's going to uh, go render me a specific custom version that has some kind of uh, like uh, 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 watermark, not not yeah. watermark, like it's not like something you would see, like a digital, like a, watermark. A digital yeah. watermark yeah. that's embedded throughout the movie that's very unique to my specific file that I will never be able to see or identify so visually. So that is basically what they do for screeners. That that actually oh, yeah. that, that technology already exists. Yeah, I heard about Wait, that what's a screener? So screeners are like like they have a movie that's about to come out in a couple of weeks or a month, right? And so somebody like uh, Siskel and Ebert, of course, we I think they're both dead. Now, right. Yeah. <laughs> somebody like back that. in our day yeah. with Siskel and Ebert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, somebody like that. They will mail a screener to. Gotcha. And so, so they can screen the movie. So and, they can watch it before review it. and review it and all of that. I see. But the but they want to know who if, has that copy exactly. I see. So yeah. it's it's a fingerprint Mm -hmm. basically it's a digital fingerprint yeah so they could do something like that and that way they could theoretically sue you or whatever if they found that hey look this is out on the BitTorrent site now you know and and you (laughs) download this or whatever there's a billion copies out there yeah Yeah. so you know you could potentially be it could be traced back to you more easily and i think there's enough computing power now on the servers that they could render a custom version custom fingerprint for every single download Oh, no problem yeah 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 Yeah. no Uh, i could see that might have been a problem 10 or 15 years ago but today, I don't. I don't think that would be an issue at all. I have to tell you, I would be perfectly fine with that. I would too, because I mean, I'm just going to throw it up on my server. I'm going to be the one watching it. I'm not going to. I have no reason to upload it to BitTorrent or anything like that. Right. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's a great idea. What I mean, you, you could have that like built into something like Plex, where it's like, I want to purchase this movie. It renders it on the service. You download it directly to your your Plex um, account, or then then into your the server on your home or wherever right. you're running it. Um, and then you could play it right there well, forever. So, so this brings up, actually, one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure we hit on, and this is perfect timing for it, uh, so great segue. So um, part of the problem with all this going digital and, and streaming stuff and never actually owning anything is, you know, when I was a kid, one of my favorite things to do was loan something that I had, whether it was a book or, you know, a DVD or whatever, to a friend and let them watch it. And they've kind of removed that ability with, with all this digital stuff, and same thing with, with DRM. And, so one of the reasons that I think, you know, piracy and, and is for at least in, in my group of friends is used is so I can share my media with my friends, you know, right? Like like I used to yeah. 20, 30 years ago. Right. 
Well, now it's um, even hardware they're trying to lock down mm-hmm. where you're not even able to work on your own hardware. I don't know if you've yeah, followed yeah. that. I mean, yeah, I just, that's a whole different topic. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but it's yeah. like not, not only yes. can you not own it, but you can't repair anything. You can't loan anything <laughs> out. Like it's everything is just getting more and more locked down. Um, Futurama so did a great episode on that with with Bender when they upgraded Bender and Mom Friendly Robot Company got extremely annoyed and she said something like. How dare a person modify something they own? I'm gonna sue them. To yeah. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that. Yeah, that's that. That's definitely related. Um, and I can see, you know, in the future where that that kind of stuff's definitely gonna happen. Um, we will have a license to yeah. have our phones. You know, yeah, that, yeah. That's where it. you'll never really own the phone, and after five years, you'll give it back to Apple or something. I, yeah. I can definitely see a future like that. Um, you know, a lot of companies really like, you know, they've, they've, they've already built planned obsolescence in, into things. You know, Apple does it with, and they, they deny it, but it's what they're doing. After five years, we quit providing iOS updates. It's not because the phone can't take the latest software. <laughs> they'll, yeah. they'll say, oh, yeah, well, that phone will run too slow. Right. And the experience won't be as good. But the truth of the matter is it would run, and you could use that. But yeah. they, they choose not to. It's planned obsolescence, and, yeah. and a lot of things are. They want you to spend another $1,000 on yeah. a brand new phone. So. Yeah. You know, Microsoft is one that uh, has been, um, at least historically speaking, uh, not nearly as guilty of that. And I think the reason is pretty obvious because they only sold the software. They didn't yeah. sell the hardware. They had no incentive to get you to upgrade uh, like Apple does because it's it's bundled with the hardware. So, you know, Windows uh, XP would still run, for example, on really old systems uh, <laughs> that were you know, uh, 10, 10 years old or whatever. Uh, where Apple would have never allowed their software to run on a machine more than like three years old. That's that's yeah. typically like their yeah. their threshold, you know. So makes anyway. sense. Well, I think um, we're sort of at the end of our time for uh, for this podcast. Is there anything else we need to cover today? Or I, I had one other thought on you know the piracy scenarios. Like um, I feel like there's some benefits other than just getting free entertainment and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if you guys ran into this, but when I started my IT career, I could not afford any of the programming oh my gosh. or database tools. And, um, you know, I pirated a certain database. Mm-hmm. Let's just call it, I don't know, SQL Server. Um, <laughs> just to, for make-believe purposes. Um, because it was like a production database and it was, you know, you had to buy... You had to buy it for a certain number of seats or something yeah, like that, or no, CPUs. Yeah, I, I totally remember and it's like, that. I just want to play with this thing. And now it's so much friendlier for programmers. Yeah, to, yeah, to to development get their licenses hands on. and VMware's now got VMUG, and there's there's all kinds of ways. But back then, yeah, you could not. Yeah, your your IDEs, your programming mm-hmm. languages were proprietary, and so early in my career, I pirated a lot of tools just to learn, just to kind of assist my career, mm-hmm. and then. A combination of I could afford to buy the tool or the tool is just free out of the gate because the companies are like, hey, if we give this away for free, people will use it. Um, yeah. And they just found other ways to, to monetize it. To monetize it's, it. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting. You bring it, Most of the tools that you're talking about there sound like they're, they're Microsoft tools. And it is my opinion, and I've heard other people share this opinion as well, including a guy I know that works or used to work for Microsoft, that Microsoft never really tried all that hard to stop individual piracy of like right. their operating systems and their their you know development tools and stuff like that um now they obviously tried to shut down like big companies like including yeah. bootlegs on you know thousands of computers are shipping out they, they they would definitely go after those guys but like the average guy like copy windows 95 or windows xp or something like that i think that they made it a little uh annoying they turned but not, a blind eye on, yeah on purpose. and yeah. i think that was because they're like well gee you know, we don't really want you to pirate it, but if your other choice is you're going to use Linux or a Mac, we just rather you have a pirated copy of Windows because <laughs> it keeps you in our ecosystem. Well, yeah. you know, and um, interesting enough, full circle, going back to where we started with early games in our childhood, I, I do wonder if some of those companies, you know, like like I would have never bought maybe Spelunker, for example. That's one you brought up, right? I, I maybe never would have bought that, um, but I had it, and now I told all my friends how much I loved it. I, I would, I could say that, by pirating it, I might have actually helped their sales. <laughs> there, there has always that, been that counter argument that yeah. piracy kind of is free advertising. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it was like the early form of of uh, shareware. Well, I was actually about to, to make that exact comparison that shareware, I think, um, 
evolved from piracy, like BBS is sharing <clears throat> games and stuff. Somebody realized, I don't know who was the first to do shareware, but, uh, you know, clearly like uh, uh, Duke Nukem 3D was one of the first shareware games I ever played. Uh, but, uh, you know, clearly they saw that, hey, people pass this stuff around on BBSs. Let's make a limited version and put it out there. But, you know, there were some other games that <laughs> I've read stories about where uh, the copy protection wouldn't, uh, if it detected that it was a copy, it wouldn't stop you from playing the game, but it would keep you from winning it. Oh, yeah, that's funny. yes, there's several of those. Yeah, <laughs> and so, but the, the the problem with that is, though, in my opinion, that, that they should have taken that a little step further and actually put some kind of message on the screen informing the user, because I think a lot of people just couldn't figure out what was wrong. But right. I think if they'd played the game and got so far, and then it popped up and says, "Well, this is a pirated game, so you can't win," then it'd be like, ah. I have to go buy the real thing so I can <laughs> right. finish so it. So I can know? finish it. Yeah. So yeah. I think that was a missed opportunity. <laughs> Probably was. Because they yeah. already had the code there to detect, you know, and yeah. cause it not to work. Yeah. They what should've... they would do is they would make the final boss like be like unbeatable. Yeah. Like, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think they, again, you know, with sixty four K they didn't have the RAM to just put that one little text message yeah. there. Like, yeah, I think I think they could have I think they could have fit in at least, you know, ten character message saying something. Just to give the yeah. user an, an, yeah. an understanding that it's not working. It just said pirated at the bottom yeah. or something, and then that would be it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, anyway. I don't even know how long we've been going because we don't have uh, a, a... Yeah, we should we should definitely have a clock for future ones uh, hanging on the wall and <laughs> and uh, stuff, but we've been going right about 45 minutes. Okay. All right. All right. Well, well uh, go us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is... The, I think this can c- conclude our first... Uh, podcast, and we'll uh, we'll see how it goes, and and then we'll uh, yeah, and I, you know I think we'll uh, we'll this is an experiment. There's probably all kinds of audio issues and things that we'll learn after we do this, and we'll have to keep we'll make it better every time, and uh, and uh, and I think too maybe take some notes and stuff uh, yeah. to keep us on track for moving around. But I think it was yeah. I think it was really good, and I I I, I personally enjoyed the conversation, <laughs> yeah. whether the people listening to us too or not. Right, I it's strictly know, but... for our benefit. We, we don't care about the uh, ignorant masses, you know. Just, <laughs> just a chance for us to nerd out. To... All right. Awesome. Well, that uh, you want to end us up, and I don't really have anything else to say. Like I said, I wasn't planned out. Uh, didn't plan out the ending very well. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so typically they'll say like, "How can we find you on the internet?" Or you know, Twitter, website, Facebook. I honestly, but... think anybody listening to this probably know, <laughs> knows that yeah, already. Yeah, but, maybe, uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but you can definitely find us at thegeekpub.com and the8bitguy.com, and from yeah. there, there's there's all kinds of content to explore and. Yeah. And learn about and uh, yeah. All right. Well, we've got. We will see you guys in the next podcast. Okay. Signing off. <laughs>